Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. I'll call this meeting to order. And um, we'll continue with speakers on item 7.6, activating federal provincial funding to increase housing options for Toronto residents. And if I could have Adrian Blackwell joining us. Okay. Good afternoon, Adrian. Thank you. You have five minutes. And oh, is are the clocks not working? I'm Adrian Blackwell, an associate professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Mona Dye is from Open Architecture Collaborative Toronto. We worked with a team of interns, intern architects, and designers. Um, to support the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty's proposition to expropriate land at 2014 to 2030 Sherburne Street for social housing. Um, we believe that the National Housing Fund should be channeled into the construction of new rent geared to income housing on this site. Um, it is currently undergoing rapid gentrification and intensification. And at the same time, it's a place that houses many of the city's most vulnerable low-income residents. In the early 1970s, as many house lots in this neighborhood were consolidated to build towers, activists and architects rallied to save existing fabric and build housing um, for the growing ranks of low-income residents. Architects like Diamond and Myers developed infill strategies to counter what they called the doomsday scenario of a downtown filled up entirely with towers. Planning changes since the mid-1990s, like the two kings to the south of this site, um, the redevelopment of Regent Park to the east, and the central city intensification to the west, have gentrified the area surrounding Sherburne with towers on all sides, making um, pushing out the working class jobs and people and making the city's poorest neighborhood unaffordable to its own inhabitants. In the context of all this high-rise density, residents participating in the consultation meetings that we held argued that this site should be redeveloped as social housing, maximizing the number of rent geared to income units in the face of the avalanche of unaffordable housing being built all around it. Um, we held two um, community workshops with OCAP. Um, and they looked at four different qualities of the building. Um, the overall form of the building, and we presented uh, people in the community meetings with three different options. A low-rise options, which uh, people really liked for the courtyard that faced the street. Um, a mid-rise option that also had a courtyard, but some residents felt was a little um, unwelcoming in having to go under the tower to get into it. And a high-rise version. And many of the respondents at the community meetings we held really liked the high-rise version because it pr proposed the most units um, to meet the large numbers of condominium units around it. Um, we asked residents what kinds of programs should happen at grade and in the public areas of the building. And the most commonly um, demanded programs were free and low-cost meal programs, um, community health center, and um, community center offering social employment programs. We asked them about public space qualities, and they were interested in green, accessible, open spaces where the community can find tranquility and community. 
um, and we asked them about the domestic spaces, the interior spaces, and participants um, expressed a desire for decently designed and maintained private dwellings um, with common spaces between them and for units that were universally accessible. So um, as a group of architects, we designed uh, a synthesis of this. We proposed a large rent geared to income housing project that is welcoming, open, and connected with the DTE community in every way. To accomplish this, the building is designed in two parts, a sloped podium that forms a courtyard open to Sherburne Street and an 18-story tower that accommodates most of the units. The U-shaped podium is inspired by the infill housing built surrounding it in the 1970s. It matches the height of Sherburne Pembroke housing to the south, stepping down to four stories on the west side to allow sunlight into the courtyard, and finally to three stories to meet the historic house, forming a strong connection with surrounding buildings and framing the open public space on the site. The tower, housing the majority of residential units, rises 18 stories on top of, five, of the five-story podium, similar in height to the 22-story Sherburne Estates building across the street. It responds to the existing developer-driven architecture of the city, matching its high density in order to create an equivalent floor area of rent geared to income units as a contemporary condominium would have. Um, the courtyard um, is overlooked by two floors of public programs um, serving the vulnerable residents of the community. In response to, to comments from the community meeting, um, it has lots of greenery, places to sit, and it includes um, a drop-in center, a meal program, a uh, health center, and um, an employment services center. Um, sorry, and these are shown on this plan here. And you can see this in the report that we've distributed to you. Um, so the next steps that we're interested in demanding is a framework for the expropriation of this site. Um, we think it's very important that the city challenges development that displaces those who are most vulnerable in the DTE and threatens to make the downtown a livable place only for those who can afford it. And I think what, I, what we were trying to show with our discussion of the neighborhood is that there are strongly encroaching and gentrifying forces that are pushing low-income people out of this neighborhood. And this kind of a development could um, resist that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, um, Brandon Jowett. Brandon? No longer here? No, okay. Uh, Maurice Adango. Good afternoon, Maurice. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be pretty quick because I think the technical stuff that has been explained is pretty clear. My name is Maurice Adongo. I work at uh, Street Health. I work at Dundas and Shabon. I've been there for like almost 20 years. And uh, I'm a community health worker. Essentially, I'm a mental health worker. And. Uh, the people I work with are the ones you see on the streets all the time. You go to Danda Square and all that kind of stuff. So what I'll tell you is what I see, what I've seen for 20 years. Uh, there is, for my client and for the people who live around the street, we have a permanent state of crisis and emergency. People live like if you go to the ER, the streets is our ER, but it has only the pavement and a lot of other things that you don't want to deal with. So what do people do there? They eat there. They sleep there. They rest, quote unquote, there in the streets. And if you are at Dundas and Shabon, you can go any direction. You can go towards parliament. You will see the same people struggling to stay alive. You can go west to George Street, walk along George Street, is even worse. You can go up towards Carlton, terrible. Or you can go south towards the Moss Park, even worse. But you will see one good thing, and this is where these uh, people have done their job to create that stuff. That's when you're going down towards Moss Park, 
There's that space. There's that red building. It's sitting there. So you got people lying around on the streets and sleeping on the streets. And you got this building, which there's nothing in it, and a whole piece of land. You don't have to be a genius to figure that something is wrong with that. Something is definitely wrong with that. And this is the solution. So the, 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 the condos are all over. Now we are surrounded by it. Uh, Jarvis and Dundas is now the new Manhattan of Toronto, lucky you and me. But I'll tell you something else. The reason I like this proposal is that a group of people came together, they invested their time, their commitment, their talent, truly unimaginable skills, their vision, their passion, their heart, and a, a, a group of activists whom you have known for a long time joined in that process. So the product is something visible, it's tangible, it's doable. It's not talk. It is on the table. And it is hard to find a reason why we can't do this. And we will come to the land piece very quickly because I know I have just about two minutes left. Now, I believe that sometimes bold moves change things. In 1998, in this city, we met right out here. We came with the proposal to declare homelessness a national disaster. It was, and that was a game changer. When we did it, some people, the, 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 the cynicals just say, oh, it's the same usual guys, the same usual crap. But it brought everybody else across the city, across the province, across the country. And the amount of money raised to pull people out of poverty and into housing is quite big if someone could research it. So I'm saying this is a positive thing. This is a doable thing. Now, the problem is the land is private property. And I think the proposal is that the city has said they'll look into it. They'll do appraisal of the site. They'll use a standardized approach. And then they will, if it is approved by the council, pay the market rate. In other words, you ain't going out there grabbing people's land. You're paying them. And you're telling them this thing is sitting here for 10, 20 years. And people are lying under the roads and all that, which is not acceptable to the city. So if something like that can be done and it's within the reach of the city, and you got people who are investing their time to pull out something this amazing, it would really be something special for us to just look at it, roll our eyes, clap around. Maurice, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Yes. Thank you. I'm wrapping up by asking you, please give this thing a positive, careful, thoughtful look. Don't dismiss it with a typical cynicism that thrives in political spaces. OK? Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you, Maurice, for joining us here. Um, I believe uh, Yogi Akaraya is here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yogi Acharya. I'm an organizer with the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Uh, one of the groups that's part of the collaboration that today is proposing this development uh, for 214 to 230 Sherburne. And in making a case for it, the report goes into quite a bit of detail about the proposal itself. But I think what's important to say to all of you as councillors is that I think you recognize that Toronto today has more condo towers under construction than any other North American city. You know that the housing market is not only saddling people with stifling debts and obscene rents, it's also critically gutting the housing supply that's available to uh, Toronto's poor. Um, and the consequences of that combination are particularly uh, visible at the corner of Dundas and Sherburne. You only need to walk through it once uh, to get a sense of uh, the hundreds of people, poor and homeless people, who are trying to survive on harsh conditions on the streets there. And as relentless condo development approaches Dundas and Sherburne from all sides, uh, property owners and business associations in the area are escalating demands for 
uh, increasing policing in the area and for closure of services that are provided to poor and homeless people in the area. And it is in this context that you have these seven properties, uh, steps from the southwest intersection of Dundas and Sherburne that are up for sale. And it is in this context that the threat of homes for the wealthy being built in a neighborhood overwhelmingly populated by poor and working class people is, is very real. You know, people at Dundas and Sherburne for 10 years have watched those properties lie vacant and that giant 30 room house at 230 Sherburne abandoned, largely abandoned. Um, imagine the added brutality of them finally seeing housing being built on that land, but it being the kind they cannot even dream of, of, of affording. The proposal that we present to you, and I urge you to give it careful consideration, proposes hundreds of uh, rent geared to income units that can be built on site. And more importantly, it proposes a radical transformation of Dundas and Sherburne that is inclusive of its most vulnerable residents and doesn't happen at its expense, which is precisely what would happen if gentrification is allowed to continue and that corner of Dundas and Sherburne is allowed to fall into the hands of a developer. You know, Councillor Wong Tam, you moved a motion uh, in March of last year when these properties were publicly listed for sale, urging the Director of Affordable Housing to do the necessary background work in order to assess uh, purchase, purchasing or expropriating these properties. Nothing has happened on that since June of last year. They have delegated authority to put in uh, uh, an offer should the properties be listed for sale, but a, but a conditional offer put in by the city can't compete with an offer from a private developer uh, on that site. Uh, we've also been told that maybe there is a report c coming uh, sometime in November to council that talks about a broad strokes expropriation strategy for the city. But the reality is, and you know this, that council has been expropriating properties in absence of a grand expropriation strategy. A strategy is good, but those properties could be sold any given time this fall. We don't know when they will be sold, but they could be sold any time before then. You have the opportunity to not let Dundas and Sherburne be yet another casualty in this ongoing uh, avalanche of condominiums, as Adrian put it, and step in, expropriate that property. You know, for our part, um, we've worked in that neighborhood for 30 odd years. I've been there for about five. People in OCAP have been there for much, much longer. Um, we know those properties have been a historic part of Toronto's poor who have, surviving in that, who have survived in that neighborhood. Three rooming houses existed there. They were demolished. The tenants who were living in them, they were pushed out. We are committed in this fight to make sure that those properties will be part of the future of poor and working class people at Dundas and Sherburne. So I want to encourage you today to not merely move past this item once the deputants here leave. I want to encourage you to actually move a motion to revisit the expropriation of these properties and ask the affordable housing director to start the proceedings uh, to start uh, expro like purchase it or expropriate these properties. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Any questions of the speaker? Councillor Wong Tan. Yes, and thank you, Yogi, for your presentation. Um, the request to have this committee um, direct staff to initiate expropriation without a report, without a determined price, um, and knowing that there is an evaluation framework that the staff are trying to uh, develop, which I believe is coming in, in the, the third quarter of this year, the fourth quarter of this year, that's going to assess how they would evaluate all properties across the city through an expropriation strategy. Um, how do we reconcile parceling off one piece when we don't have the background work that's done. And, and, and to be quite honest, I, I, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing the, the deputations, but I'm struggling because the process is, 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 is not lining up right now based on what you're wanting and what staff are saying uh, is feasible. I mean, at the same time, you know properties were expropriated on George Street. Three properties were expropriated on George Street for the George Street revitalization project. The city expropriated Birkdale residents in Scarborough for the same reason. Um, expropriations are happening in our city outside of a grand expropriation strategy. That strategy will be great. We'll assess uh, how good or bad it is when, it, when the report's tabled, but the reality is that the city is proceeding with expropriations based on, in, in the public interest and based on need. And I 
can't make a better case for you for how bad the need at Dundas and Sherburn today is. Come to a long time, you've been there and you recognize the, the, the state of that uh, neighborhood. And if any time a case could be made in the public interest for housing, I think that neighborhood is, a, is the top contender. So recognizing that staff was given direction uh, in March 2018 uh, to engage discussion with the owner, which I know that they did, to determine whether or not they could come up with an arrangement to purchase. Uh, those negotiations, I believe, were not necessarily successful. This is why, where we are today. Um, and, uh, and then to initiate the expropriation, uh, there has to be, there has to be some, some legitimate compelling reasons because the expropriation can also be challenged. And from my understanding, and you may, you may gather this as well, is that it could actually take longer through expropriation, and it can be a much more costly process through expropriation than actually negotiating with a willing buyer and a willing seller, um, in this case, which we don't have. I'm not saying I don't support it. I'm trying to find the way to, a, a path forward. I think it's undeniable that they're not willing sellers to the city. If you look back to news media articles back to 2013, they're quoted as saying that they're not interested in selling to the media. But Bhushan and Rekha Tanija are not just owners of those seven properties. They're owners of multiple rental properties all across the city. They're also a part of a group of property owners in the neighborhood who are challenging the city's OPA 82, the Official Plan Amendment 82, uh, which is grossly insufficient. But even that little uh, thing is being challenged. So you know that they are not going to balk at selling these lands to a pro private developer. So I think that, that there is the the reason for expropriation. You know, you've tried engaging with them, they're not responsive. And the way the city dealt with it with the George Street property owners was that the city expropriated those properties. So why not in this case? Okay. I don't think it's as straightforward because there was a willing seller in this case, but um, let me, I'm gonna try to get you some responses uh, by answering, asking staff the same questions. Perhaps that might be helpful. Okay, um, but not now. <laughs> a little bit later, when it's time to ask questions of staff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and if I could have Greg Cook joining us. Good afternoon, Greg. Afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Cook. I'm an outreach worker at Sanctuary Ministries Toronto. Uh, we are located um, not too far we're in the downtown east um, from this uh, proposed site. Um, I'm also on the steering committee of the Shelter and Housing Justice Network. I've been doing outreach in the downtown east since 2005. I'd like to speak to the item regarding activating federal and provincial funding to increase housing options for Toronto residents. Currently, there are no housing options for thousands of Toronto residents. The situation is so bad that current city plans don't even have a strategy to ensure housing for most people who are homeless in Toronto. Obviously, we need different plans, and I think this is a, a great one. Um, currently, City of Toronto data acknowledges the following. The shelters are overflowing despite hundreds of new cots being added in the last two years. Encampments in city parks, ravines, and industrial lands have doubled in the last few years. Market rent has more than doubled in the last 10 years. Minimum wage, OW, and ODSP haven't kept up with inflation in that time. From what I'm seeing on the ground, housing workers are essentially giving up on trying to get people into market rent apartments, even if they have the $600 rent subsidies. Downtown emergency rooms are packed with people adversely affected by the housing crisis. Most people I talk to have essentially given up getting a, any sort of housing. So they are buying tents, sleeping under, in underground parking garages. They are waiting for lists, on, on waiting lists for crammed respite centers, um, and also making encampments on industrial land in Scarborough and Etobicoke. In the summer, people are suffering outside from dehydration and food insecurity. They don't have safe and comfortable spaces to recover from the flu act or, or any accidents that they might encounter. Um, they are forced to navigate life with illnesses such as diabetes and Alzheimer's. On average, two people are dying each week in Toronto without housing. The City of Toronto has failed to take leadership and build rent gear to income housing. The affordable housing label that the city uses is a joke. 80% of market rent is not affordable. Um, for hundreds of thousands of our Torontonians. The City of Toronto has stopped trying to ensure that these people have access to housing. Even building housing that fits this label isn't materializing. As I understand it, in 2017, Toronto only built 300 units. 
and in 2018, it was less than 500. This is broken. People are suffering, people are dying. Things need to change drastically. This plan that OCAP and Open Architecture has brought forward, this plan with extensive community consultation is bold and innovative and important. Not only does it offer a path to hundreds of new units in a short time period, it offers a blueprint that can be emulated dozens of times in the months and years to come. It offers a policy vision that City Hall doesn't currently have. If the city is serious about equity, about quality of life for its residents, this initiative is a must. Everyone should have a right to the city. We need a government that recognizes and creates policy and funding streams that ensures this is the case. At the moment, thousands of people are being displaced from their neighborhood. This needs to change. Thank you so much. Any questions of the speaker? Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you, Greg, for your uh, deputation. Um, with respect to the proposal, uh, this is the proposal you're talking about yep. that's been tabled. Um, and I apologize, I'm, I'm just seeing it now, so I haven't had a chance to entirely read it. Um, did, the, did, your, did open architecture consult with or speak to city planning staff regarding what you're proposing? the massing, the built form, the articulation of the buildings, the impact of the heritage properties, the adjacency to the neighborhood. Was any of that done before all of this work came about? Um, I think they'd be better at answering that. I, was, I wasn't involved in those kinds of details. Okay. Sorry, just my, my apologies. That's okay. Did you want to speak to that? Well, I mean, I'm maybe a representative of the group. I'm not part of open architecture, but, um, but we did not consult, no, but we do practice architecture in the city and are knowledgeable of many of the issues involved. Thank you. Okay. We're good? I think Councilor. Yes, that, that'll do. <laughs> Councilor Fletcher, you have questions? If that architect doesn't mind, I've got one question oh. for him. I've been watching we, we've, we've, or whoever is, has the model here. Just looking at the cost to build per square foot, if you've determined that for this. I'm sure you have because as an, you know that that's number one, is to know how much your building will cost. We have not investigated that, no. So you don't have a price per unit or a cost per square foot? No, this is, I mean, you, can see, that you can see that this is a very preliminary no, design. It's yep. an urban design proposal. We don't even have floor plans of the tower floors because we're not, we deliberately didn't do that because we weren't sure what types of units were of most need in the neighborhood. And yeah. we didn't pursue that in the community. I hear meetings. you. No ballpark. Yeah. Normally, you'd kind of have some ballpark there. But you don't have that yet. No, but I okay. think it's, it's not unlike any other uh, housing building to, that would be built in the city. Great. That you've built? No. Or that has been built, you mean? That is being okay. currently built. Is being built. built. OK, Correct. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any of the speakers on this item? Seeing none, questions of staff? Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, and thank you. Um, with, with the indulgence of the chair and the committee, I recognize that, to, that the report is not specifically speaking about Sherburne, but because there are so many deputants that came out specifically to talk about these, uh, these properties uh, clustered together, if, if, if it's okay, I'm just going to tar target my, my comments specifically to, to what was raised today, that, if that's all right. Okay, no, no objections. Um, so the question I have is maybe going back to March 2018, um, you had uh, received council direction to engage in a dialogue with the uh, owners of the properties uh, that are of, of concern, of interest today. Um, what transpired from those conversations or th that, that communication? And were you successful at getting them to agree to some dialogue around price and acquisition? Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, uh, we were unable to actually uh, engage directly with the uh, owners of the property, um, and uh, it was around the same time that the um, for sale sign had come off the property as well, and the agent for the um, uh, for the owners w w was in uncommunicative as well. Uh, so we've continued on the path of uh, bringing the report in the fall on a general acquisition expropriation policy for affordable and supportive housing. And we will bring back a specific recommendation on this site uh, at that time as well. And is there any benefit to accelerating staff's work on expropriation should, should this property meet the evaluation 
uh, you know, framework that you're going to develop, which council hasn't approved yet, um, but should there be any possibility that we can accelerate all this work? Can, can we get, can you initiate with city legal expropriation and exercise those expropriation powers this week, after, next week after council meets? Uh, so, Councillor, through the chair, um, the uh, expropriation uh, or uh, discussion, further discussions with respect to purchasing the property would need to be um, uh, approved uh, in those directions provided by City Council. Um, and and, and uh, our recommendation is to do this in the fall, particularly as well because um, th this, this property uh, is, uh, would be a substantial cost. And so as a part of these proceedings, Council would expect us as well to have identified uh, a source of funding to, um, to do this work. And, what is and, and frankly, the recommendation isn't to do it now because the context in which this should be considered is um, uh, with respect to the 10-year plan and where Council wants to put its money. So without, an evaluate, without a clear evaluation framework, uh, would we know what good value is? in terms of how do we stretch a diamond to a dollar, the taxpayer's dollar, uh, into buying the most land to build the most affordable housing, uh, close to uh, community facilities, close to transit. Is this the way for us to go without looking at all the other properties that may be available for purchase? Can you, can you answer uh, So that through question? the Chair, Councillor, uh, absolutely. Uh, there would need to be a strategic assessment with respect to where the property is located. Um, and. Um, what the, what the public value would be in that particular expropriation or purchase. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not, and you're as, you're not as the deputants have identified, there have been expropriations in the past. And I, I would refer back to in 1988 when the entire West Donlands was expropriated. And we now have a whole mixed income community being developed there on Queen Street West as well. Uh, and uh, uh, that site uh, where Park developed supportive housing was previously a burnt out building and was expropriated. So in some respects, it's a combination of there being the political will to do it, um, the, f the funding sources, and as well uh, being able to make the case that it's in the public interest to do this. And you would make that case in the public interest, is that to the courts? Should the, should the act be challenged? Expropriation yes, uh, powers being challenged? It, it, it can be challenged. Um, I think uh, once the direction is provided, staff, our preferred approach would be we, we would negotiate uh, the, the sale because um, if it is challenged, uh, we are talking about many, many months that this then um, can, can take and be dragged through. And um, our preference, uh, and it, this isn't just for housing, but for any expropriation or sale, it would be to negotiate uh, the purchase price and the sale without having to use the expropriation procedures. And finally, my, just to sum it up, so you can't move any faster. Um, however, th these parcels are not off the list. You would use the evaluation framework against the, the proposal that's uh, being put for, before us today. That's correct. Okay, so it is still possible, you just can't do it as quickly as th the proponents here would like to. Um, through the chair, I, I, we're not recommending it be done as a one-off. We're recommending it be done within a policy context so that uh, the next site that comes before us and another site comes before us, we have a framework in which we can uh, do that evaluation. I will say, just as an editorial comment, I'm thrilled to see that the work has been done and the interest that the community has brought forward on this particular project and site. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, speakers on the item? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm not, sorry, my, my brain is in, in the pediatric, I was at the doctor's office with my one month, uh, this, uh, one month baby this morning, so my apologies for missing the earlier part of the meeting. Uh, but I do recognize that this, is a, this particular object um, discussion is of great interest to many of the deputants who came out today. I want to thank them for their deputation. I want to thank them for the meetings that, that they have had with my office. Um, I certainly do understand the, the the, the urgency that's required, we can all see the plight in the neighborhood. We all know that housing, affordable housing, deeply affordable housing, housing with supports is needed urgently. If I could expropriate these powers, if I had the expropriation powers and a magic wand in my hand, I would just take it from the owner. I think we all would. Um, 
that having been said, I don't have that magic wand, and I know that there is a particular process that's underway that I, I'm going to have to trust. I also want to um, speak to the fact that the property owner has not shown any interest in engagement with the city. My conversation with the property owner predates my conversation with the OCAP. It goes back into my first term at City Council when I specifically said to him that we are looking for opportunities for housing, affordable housing and the widest range of affordability, which it, whether it's cooperative housing or if it's supportive housing or transitional housing, something has to be built on that site rather than the site being left dormant. That was back in 2012. There was no communication, very little afterwards. Uh, they showed us, actually, to be quite honest, they showed myself and some planning staff uh, some massing, uh, a tower on top of uh, uh, their site, uh, and the teardown of those, uh, those uh, heritage structures. And the planning staff at that point in time said to them, not interested, Sherburne, especially for that particular quadrant, may not be appropriate for a tall building site. And there's certainly no permissions from city council that will be granted for you to tear down those heritage structures, especially not for a purpose-built, market-driven condo project. That was the conversation we had then. So I like the fact that we're all heading in the same direction. I'm sorry that we're not all pulling at the same time, but I am very confident that we are going to be able to use the evaluation framework that staff have got to devise which will be used to evaluate against every single possibility for expropriation across the city and recognizing that there are some limitations to expropriation power with the purpose and the sole purpose these, these days about building affordable housing. That's something new. That is not something that the city, the city council prior to has ever said to staff, go off and do. So I do recognize that that is a huge amount of work. I know that we are going to be butting up against a very uh, aggressive and profit-driven, wealthy, powerful development sector that's going to be in the market with the city, competing for the same limited land resources. Uh, I also recognize that given all the, number, all the developers that are scouring every single surface lot uh, and, uh, in the city, if this, pro if this property was to be sold for a significant profit and a tidy sum, it would have been sold by now because I'm, I'm pretty confident they have been approached. However, they were not able to sell to a well-financed developer or any developer out there, let alone even responding to city staff about wanting to uh, explore the conversation about purchasing for the purposes of building affordable housing. That's the market condition that the city is working in, and there is a legislative um, framework that we have to comply with and I know that the expropriation powers are not something that the city staff is city legal or city council will exercise freely without a solid case to be built around it and I know this because I have asked Sean on multiple occasions Sean Gadden our very good uh, executive director for uh, housing secretariat I've asked him on multiple occasions why can't I just expropriate this or that to build housing and I know that the responses have been it's not that straightforward. However, I do want to end on somewhat of a positive note. Without exercising expropriation powers uh, in the downtown east, I can say, quite honestly, that we have new transitional housing being built at 257 Dundas Street East. Uh, we have uh, new housing that has now been opened, transitional homes in support of housing, uh, run by NAMI Res at 6565 Homeward Avenue. We did that without the Expropriation Act. Uh, we just recently opened 222 Carlton Street, uh, being run and operated by Native uh, Child and Family Services of Toronto. And just last week, at Toronto and East Shore Community Council, uh, we actually approved the purchase of 218 Carlton Street specifically for the purposes of affordable housing without exercising the Expropriation Act. All in total, there are over, I think about 200, almost 200 units coming online without exercising the Expropriation Act because we had a willing buyer, a willing seller, and then third party nonprofit housing providers out in the, in the community helping the city operate those, uh, those assets afterwards. So it is possible, even without the Expropriation Act, 
if we were able to do this particular uh, um, project today, given the fact that we've been able to successfully even demonstrate within the last year and a half, do four of them, uh, we would have done it. Uh, I will look forward to, you, to the report coming in November, and I suspect that uh, we are all going to be coming back to this committee to specifically review uh, the contents of that report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fletcher? Uh, I just wanted to pick up on something that a number of the deputants have said that's I think really important and reminding the committee, reminding the city about the fact that our um, kind of open for business for building condos and planning for them has meant for many low-income residents basically a clearance. Uh, particularly, I just want to focus on the rooming houses that Councillor Perks has been fighting for, ones in my ward, where developers are now looking at rooming houses and buildings. They're looking at that as an investment, as a financial gain, and then turning out people onto the street, and quite frankly, some onto the street. So those rents are very low, sometimes $400, $300, $500. People have been there for many years. And the, I just indicate that it's very much like the clearances in Scotland. People are being removed. So the, when the community is being creative about what to do about this situation in which we find ourselves, I just want to congratulate everybody for thinking outside the box, initiating this conversation, bringing us together to continue to think how we're going to maintain people in their homes, how we're going to maintain them in their rooms, how we're going to build new affordable housing in a market where just the building of it is so very, very expensive. And it is not an easy um, door to unlock, but we have to work together to figure out how to do this. I'll just note on Queen Street, since the Don Mount redevelopment a number of years ago, that simply accelerated all of the condo boom along Queen Street. And the um, Red Door shelter going in that condo was a very big deal because that church uh, should have been bought by the city when it was for sale. So even buildings that are for sale, we don't act quickly enough, particularly ones that we could have easy access to, which would be those religious institutions. And then earlier today, looking at moving the Don Somerville site to putting not only the RGI, but some affordable rental. We need to do that. We need to protect, we need to stabilize, and we need to build. So thank you for furthering this conversation here in the City of Toronto. Everybody who's part of it is a very important player in order to achieve what we need to, and that's stable housing for low-income people in the City of Toronto. Thank you so much. Any other speakers? Councilor Perks. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to thank the crowd who showed up today. Uh, this, this moment may not be the moment where we get the outcome you want, but the more often the, the people in the City of Toronto speak up and say the City has to actually stop losing land and start acquiring land. We have to stop simply approving private developments and start developing housing. The, the sooner it is we get to that moment where it happens. I, I'm, to Councillor Wong Tam, I have had those same frustrations. Uh, for years now. Uh, the City of Toronto had just simply has decided for, I want to say, nine or the last nine or ten years that no, we're not in the business of building housing, we'd rather keep taxes low. And it's time to turn that around. So thank you for your efforts. Today may not be the day, but the day is coming and I hope it's soon. Thank you. Any other speakers? Thank you. I just uh, want to thank all the uh, the speakers here today on the project. It actually looks quite beautiful, to be honest with you. So thank you, um, uh, and uh, and to say and also to thank uh, about having these conversations in the communities, uh, which are really important. So the conversations that you've had about this need in the community and have the community advocating, and I also want to thank. Um, 
Councilor Wong Tam, uh, she just listed a whole uh, list of projects that has been happening in this neighborhood, and uh, we just hope that this committee is able to open many more, not only in her community, but I, I think everybody here is looking forward to having some of these projects in all our communities. So, again, thank you for for your efforts. Thank you for uh, for the communications. I know that you've been look, working closely with the local councillor, and uh, she'll definitely be a, a champion of more of, of uh, supportive housing and affordable housing in the area. So with that, um, can I have a motion to move the report forward? Councillor Fletcher, all those in favor? That carries and that takes care of item 7.6. We're moving into item 7.7, .7, expanding supportive housing in Toronto. We have uh, speakers, um, Daphna Nussman. Daphna, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I um, just wanted to say on behalf of the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness, I'm here today speaking in support of the report and recommendation actions for item 7.7, .7, expanding supportive housing in Toronto. Increasing supportive housing opportunities is a significant part of the Alliance's strategic partnership with the City of Toronto and our shared goal of creating more effective solutions to ending homelessness. We were pleased to co-host the June 5th charrette with the City's Housing Secretariat, where over 40 housing stakeholders collaborated on addressing immediate, medium, and long-term solutions to increase supporting, supportive housing opportunities in Toronto. Um, since its release in April of this year, um, this report, which um, I have submitted titled Developing Supportive Housing Ideas in Toronto, Experiences, Experiences Challenges and Ideas, um, commissioned by the TAEH in partnership with the Maytree Foundation, has been widely read and well received by the sector as well as city staff. Our hope is that the information and recommendations within the report are used to address challenges that exist for supportive housing providers and how we can better fast track supportive housing development, which a lot of what we're addressing today. Um, it also speaks to the motion introduced earlier by Councillor Perks about increasing the capacity of nonprofit developers. Um, we also commend the City and Housing Secretariat for adopting a modular housing pilot that will provide supportive and transitional housing to those who need it most. With that said, we also need to keep our focus on permanent supportive housing development through initiatives such as Housing Now, inclusionary zoning, expediting regulatory approvals, and combining city resources and funding. The Alliance thanks the Housing Secretariat and Councillor Bilal for um, their work with us on supportive housing and for considering our recommendations. We look forward to the Charette Report and our continued work together on supportive housing opportunities. Thank you. Any questions for Daphne? No? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Uh, any questions of staff? <coughs> Seeing none. Uh, any speakers? Seeing none, I will move uh, the uh, the report and just uh, I think I'm going to echo the speaker's uh, 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 words in saying that I am looking forward to having the Charette report. Uh, we had a really interesting conversation with a lot of the providers for supportive housing and how we can better understand their needs to build more and faster uh, supportive housing. We had planning and. Uh, the Housing Secretariat uh, taking part on this initiative and um, uh, we're looking forward to working as well with the modular uh, uh, pilot project to see uh, that happening uh, sooner rather than later. So with that said, can I have uh, um, all those in favor of the report? And that carries, that takes care of item 7.7, 7.9, emergency management and vital service disruption response in apartment buildings. Uh, Mariana Lewinsky. Mariana, can you help me pronounce your last name? Uh, I suffer from the same thing. Everybody botches my name, so I, I'm traumatized. I want to make sure I, try, I give it a try. <laughs> I tell people when my parents came to Canada, they were having a sale of consonants, so they. <laughs> but it's my my. Mine rhyme was vowels. Is, yes. <laughs> Mine was. My joke is that how you spell it, I'm not picky, but please pronounce it as Lewicki. Lewicki. There's no. There you go. Okay. Thank you. 
So, uh, so thank you, Madam Chair, for recognizing me. Uh, my name is Marianna Lewicki, and I'm the president of the Park Vista Tenants Association. The association represents tenants living in four buildings at Park Vista, Ward 19, with a combined total of more than 350 units. Sometimes it becomes the role of government to codify common sense when sensible policies aren't common enough. This is one of those times. Because if there's anything worse than so-called red tape, it's the yellow and black tape that gets rolled out when a building is evacuated and tenants can't return to their home. When that happens, it's critical that there are strong requirements in place to help make the best of a bad situation. While the major fire at 650 Parliament Street in 2018 is one example of the devastating effects of displacement of hundreds of tenants, it's hardly alone in terms of stories of tenant hardship. On July 20th, 2008, an explosion at an underground hydro vault at 2 Secord Avenue uh, forced hundreds of frightened tenants to leave their building, many with just the clothes on their back. One tenant said the explosion shook the building and it seemed like a bomb went off. Non-firefighters were injured fighting the massive blaze. About 900 tenants were left scrambling to find another place to live and couldn't re-enter their unit for more than a month. A class action suit was later launched against a construction company and the City of Toronto. A settlement of 6.5 million was reached in 2014. While I've never had to deal with such a dire event at the time I've lived on Park Vista, tenants in my building have had to deal with two multi-day power outages, as well as an overnight evacuation due to a gas line leak and a water main break in 2018 that left several buildings without power for 16 hours. In 2016, when the City of Toronto was considering licensing landlords, the Park Vista Tenants Association provided a written submission. It recommended that landlords be required to have the following, evacuation plan, power outage plan, protocol for after hours emergencies, and landlord staff trained in first aid. The association also noted that standards around emergency backup power needed enhancing. We also recommended that if all elevators in a building are out, the landlord should communicate with tenants and have a contingency plan. And while our association certainly welcomes new measures, we would also appreciate it if some existing requirements were better enforced. For example, the City of Toronto's Property Standards, Chapter 629, Section 5.1, require the owners of a multiple unit dwelling to post a sign in a prominent place in the front lobby or entrance of the building with the name and phone number of the authorized person to contact in the case of an emergency on a 24-hour basis. Not only is this information valuable for tenants, it's also valuable for police, fire services, and paramedics. An emergency number should be po posted prominently, the requirement should be enforced by the city, and consideration should be given to requiring larger sign lettering. Heat, electricity, and water are referred to as vital services because they are crucial to proper living conditions. Landlords should communicate promptly with tenants when such services are interrupted and have contingency plans to deal with vital service disruptions and evacuations. Owners of single-family homes have broad powers to oversee their shelter, subject to some restrictions. Tenants don't have that same authority. Tenants don't control the property or core infrastructure such as electrical systems, heating systems, or gas supply. Tenants are sometimes at the mercy of their landlord, and with apologies to William Shakespeare, the quality of that mercy is sometimes strained. Our association applauds the regulations the City of Toronto introduced on July 1, 2017 to help better inform and protect tenants. We also believe there's an opportunity to raise the bar higher to ensure better support to tenants when emergencies arise. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input, and I thank city staff for their work on this file. Thank you so much. Any questions? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for your deputation. With respect to your written submission, you noted that um, that the city could do a better job at enforcement. I know, we're, I know we've got some new rules coming in, uh, but you have some very specific examples in your building where the existing requirements and performance of the landlord was not uh, actually enforced. Can you provide those examples to us? 
Um, okay, I mean, I know they closed a garbage chute without, like, I'm not at, I'm not at 650 Parlo. I'm, no, yes, I'm, I'm specifically asking about the content of your letter. You cited that the city could do a better job of enforcing the existing rules. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, they, you know, there's a requirement that you have to get a permit to close garbage chutes. They, they should close garbage chutes in four buildings without following the requirements of the, per, you know, the process, which involves polling tenants doing that, and they never reopen. So that's just w that's one example of a clear violation that they they did and they got it. The if you go in the lobby, there is a phone number. That phone number forwards to a call center. It doesn't, it, there's no name of a person, there's no name of an authorized, you know, representative in the building that's posted prominently in that area. So they'll give you the phone number, they won't give you a name, and if you try to get that number, you know, 24 hours, you're rooted to one, you know, call center that then routes the call somewhere else. Marianne, so, sorry, yeah. I'm just going to, I apologize for the yes. interruption, but I, I don't, um, you're saying that the city can do a better job of enforcing the existing rules. Yes, yeah, 629 5.1. And that's the specific rule that you want? Of, of the emergency contact information. And but on another note, while I'm here, they did close garbage chutes without a permit and got a free ride on it. And so did you contact the city to let them know that this was the case in your building? Yep. And so you're saying that the city did not take any action? The this city looked into it, found that they didn't do what was required in order to close the, 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 the garbage chutes. They investigated and then said, oh, well, we determined it'd be a fire hazard for them to reopen, so they're closed. And they didn't make the, the other requirements, such as arranging to have door-to-door -door garbage pickup when you close a chute. So it also left me wondering, were we at risk of a fire? before and they just found out now and now they're closing the chutes to avoid a fire hazard i don't know but it's uh, all i'm saying is if an emergency number is required by law first responder should be able to get into a building call that number an emergency and immediately reach somebody in my experience that's not happening right now okay thank you thank you so much any other questions of the speaker seeing none thank you for joining us today next at daryl chong Good afternoon, Daryl. Good afternoon, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Daryl with the Greater Toronto Apartment Association. Uh, you've seen me here many times. Members own and operate about 150,000 units of multifamily purpose built rental, mostly in the city of Toronto. Uh, we've obviously been closely monitoring the situation and the unfortunate electrical <coughs> incidents in St. Jamestown. Uh, proactively, as soon as that happened, we initiated meetings with, with um, ESA, TFS, MLS, and those meetings have continued. We want to better understand what happened and how we could prevent, our goal is to prevent this from happening again. Um, we share the same goals. Uh, we want to have safe, sound communities for our residents. The provision of purpose-built rental is complicated and it's complex. Uh, there's lots of rules and regulations and standards, the responsibility of an assortment of jurisdictions, the municipality, the province, uh, uh, administrative bodies and so on. Uh, but our main role is to provide our members with education. So over the past years, we've had lots of, I've counted here more than a dozen, uh, seminars featuring officials from the Office of Emergency Management at the city, uh, ESA, TSSA, TFS, I think Mr. Schrega and Mr. Burke from MLS uh, know how to get to my office with their eyes closed by now. Um, we're here to provide information and knowledge to our members. We pro proactively educate our members to meet regular regulatory compliance in cooperation with the appropriate authorities. We're, we generally support the recommendations in this report. Uh, we want to be part of the solution. We, I think we have the knowledge and the experience to assist and perhaps even take the lead in the creation of a vital services disruption plan, um, in, obviously in partnership with the city and of relevant administrative authorities and even certified tradespeople. So this would include the distribution and education of our members. Um, so I'm just here to say that if, if we can, we want to help. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else that would like to speak on this item? 
No, questions of staff? No, no, seeing none, speakers? Councillor Wong Tem? Uh, yes, thank you. I just want to move the, uh, the recommendations in the staff report and also to thank staff for uh, the exceptional work that they did. I recognize that um, the, the recommendation before us is going to be amending the regulations and the, uh, and the requirements in the Rent Safe Program. Um, and, uh, and this is specifically around vital service disruptions in building and having a plan in place when emergencies do take place. Um, and of course, we've experienced these emergencies and mass displacements in, the, in St. Jamestown uh, of, uh, as of late. 650 Parliament, 1,500 residents displaced uh, as of August 2018, still without homes, uh, still floating about in every corner of the city uh, in every possible uh, accommodations uh, known. Uh, and of course, we've also seen uh, an electrical power outage that took place at 260 Wellesley, which was the second catalyst to bring us to this report today. Um, I, I want to just acknowledge the fact that the residents who have actually endured that hardship uh, are not here to depute today. Um, and they haven't really shown up at City Hall waving any banners or placards and demanding uh, for better service. And that's largely bec because um, some of these residents are tired and traumatized and they're left to their own devices um, and they have been scattered into the winds. Um, and it's also because these are newcomer communities. Uh, it's also because this is low income housing. It's also because the fact that the City of Toronto's uh, process may not be accessible to everyone, even if they have English proficiency. Uh, whether it's the hours that we meet or just by the way we conduct our business, not everyone knows how to interface with this order of government at these particular points in time. Um, but I do want to thank staff for going out to the community uh, in the times of crisis uh, through either uh, our first responders who have been exceptional, Toronto Fire, Toronto Paramedics, Toronto Police, uh, as well as the Office of Emergency Management. There were things that we could have done better and clearly uh, this report now reflects that. I, I do think it's important to, to acknowledge that as a local councillor, I will say this, I had to push pretty darn hard. Uh, to make sure that we are going to have an accurate response to vital service disruptions in, in buildings. Uh, because this is not the first time we've had mass evacuation uh, in the City of Toronto. We've had it with Secord, we've had it with the Sunrise explosion, I'm not necessarily there, but, but we've had mass displacements. But we've never gone back and said that a property owner, a landlord, should have an emergency plan when it comes to providing, a com providing accommodations, clear and consistent uh, communication with their tenants. Uh, it should be in force, uh, and as well as if you don't have a plan that's not up to a particular uh, standard, uh, and if it's going to uh, cause a lot of harm, perhaps a loss of life, uh, you should be punished. This is what's so important about this report. I know that there's not a lot of people here to speak to it, but this, is, this report actually says you will be charged. You will be charged if you don't have a vital service disruption plan. And that, that is significant because the next time it happens, it could happen in a different community other than St. Jamestown. God knows we don't want it to happen anywhere, but certainly we're not interested in seeing more displacements. Um, this is the right step forward and it's actually a m massively needed uh, new intervention that I believe will uh, strengthen the, the intentions of Rent Safe TO, which is of course to provide adequate, decent housing for tenants. Um, and I want to just thank staff for that work um, because I know you rushed this to, to a conclusion and you went out to the community and you heard from them about what went right, what went wrong, what was done, what wasn't done, and what we need to do to move forward um, to make it better the next time around. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers? Seeing none, will all those in favour? That carries. Okay. Item 7.11, we'll start with a city staff presentation and then we'll move to speakers right after that.
to start. Yes. You ready? Great. Yes, of course. Let's go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tamara Anson Cartwright. I'm Program Manager in Heritage, and my colleague uh, Gary Miedema will, together, will provide a 10 minute update and an uh, overview of the report in front of you for consideration. In 2017, City Council directed the City Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to undertake this feasibility study. It was not until 2018 when uh, plan PGM, Planning and Growth Management, recommended to advance this project that we uh, assign some of our capital dollars to uh, uh, really undertake the study. So in June 2018, we uh, looked to this issue in earnest and commenced our feasibility study. This report summarizes the conclusions and recommendations from it. A Toronto Heritage City uh, survey is an ambitious and multi-year program that will modernize the day-to-day -day work of city planning, resulting in a robust understanding of heritage. One would one ask ourselves at times, what is heritage and, of course, what is the role of heritage in city planning? I think one of the things that what's most remarkable for us is that the definition or the, the changing perception of cultural heritage. And no other city than like Toronto has really had to embrace this, uh, this idea. Twelve years ago, in 20, uh, 2007, Council adopted the principle of a Phase 1 Heritage Management Plan that provided this planning framework and a strategy for managing heritage. The plan recognized that our, our, under, our understanding of the past and of our heritage resources requires us to pay attention to the overlapping layers of history and to the diversity of stories and symbolism and to uh, uh, consider that for the future. In the uh, preceding, though, is uh, the, this concept that, uh, of, of this management plan. At the same time, we have this confluence of rapid pace of development. We know that, not, that uh, old and new can coexist and together can enrich our sense of place and revealing the layers of the, of the, the, of the city's culture. However, we need to look at, and in this report explains, the principles and methodologies for a survey that is strategic and, and can accelerate the identification of heritage properties to respond to the rapid pace of development. Toronto is an evolving and a culturally vibrant city. The reality, however, is that uh, despite the 45 years of uh, heritage identification and evaluation, there has yet to be a comprehensive and over, over, uh, overarching organized um, effort to identify the city's heritage in the amalgamated city of 20 years ago. Large portions of the city have not been surveyed for heritage properties. An unknown number of heritage pro properties remain unidentified. We must reach areas and neighborhoods of the city that have yet to be looked at systematically for their places of cultural heritage value. And you can see on this illustration here on the left side is a, is a map indicating the uh, heritage properties in the uh, heritage register, high concentration in the, in the downtown area, the old city of Toronto. Um, the other is that what we have looked at in the last uh, five to six years as surveyed area, there's much, as I said, that has yet to be looked at. A streamlined, uh, streamlined heritage planning is our objective, um, moving from a reactive mode to a proactive mode. The, sur the survey will give us greater clarity to council, owners, and the public, providing publicly accessible baseline data on cultural heritage resources which will inform future decisions on a range and a variety of planning tools for heritage protection as individual properties or as districts. What is a citywide survey? It's an international best practice. Most of the North American cities, leading cities are doing it, UK, Australia. A survey is a starting resource for local planning, heritage planning. It in itself is not a statutory role. Rather, the as a survey helps municipal governments make decisions that reflect on the local heritage values, supports the creation of a heritage list or heritage areas, which identify places to be protected under a local planning regime. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Miedema. Again, I was the project manager for this study, and I'd like to recognize off the top that we had a project team composed of people from across the city planning division. Uh, that participated in this. Uh, we wanted it to, to make sure that it was understood this was not a heritage tool, but this is a city planning tool. And I want to thank them all for, uh, for their help uh, in this study. 
Um, the key sources of information behind this study, uh, apart from benefiting from our own best practices, and that was a part of our process, was to do a sector scan of other leading municipalities in North America and beyond, uh, and then to take the best advice that we received from that sector scan and bring it to Toronto and speak to our own leading experts in our own heritage sector here to understand how best to apply that. And that's a, a summary that is also in the report. The technical expert panel was uh, a really fruitful part of our study, and this was a group of, again, leading experts on heritage surveys in Ontario who met with us three times to give us an, an advice on how to translate that sector scan into a Toronto context. And their larger summary of their advice is in attachment one. And then into the recommendations, uh, and this uh, graphic from attachment three is really uh, probably the best summary of what we're proposing uh, through our report. And that is uh, we are proposing to start with a, a phase one, a, a startup phase starting in 2019, moving through 2020 and into 2021 that will allow us to do two things. First, to build the necessary resources for a large scale project and uh, two, to test our methodologies uh, uh, within our existing study work program and by working through the backlog of nominations uh, so that we thoroughly understand our methodologies and we can come back to council in 2021 with a report uh, that can review phase one and present a more thorough costing and how we can scale this up. So in answer to the question of how long is this gonna take and how much is it gonna cost, our answer is, this is why we need phase one. We need to test and make sure we can come back with really good answers following some uh, testing in, in phase one. Uh, I would want to highlight uh, as well on this slide just the two pieces, the communication strategy and how important that's going to be to us, and an Indigenous engagement program that uh, we have been talking with the Indigenous Affairs Office about beginning in 2019. So we'd like to start our engagement on this program with Toronto's Indigenous communities. And then to drill down a little bit further into two particular items, uh, we understand uh, that we need a robust data management system in order to uh, manage this program. And uh, we are working through the IT governance process right now uh, in order to secure some seed funding to help us first understand our own processes and systems so that we can uh, make the right ask for the right tool. And Arches on top right is an open source data management uh, platform developed by the Getty Institute in the United States for cultural heritage management. And uh, we're seriously looking into that as well through the seed funding initiative. And then uh, briefly just to talk about the methodology uh, that we want to propose. We, uh, the best practice really for this scale of a survey is to use a uh, citywide historic context statements. And these are really historical narratives that uh, tell us how the city and neighborhoods within the city have evolved and changed over time, what the key drivers are, the key significant periods are, and then we can look at individual properties and areas and understand how directly or not they relate to those context statements and that can help us define their significance. So those context statements are gonna be a critical part of phase one. Uh, the survey will then result in a database uh, and, and accessible through a map so everybody can review it. Community consultation will happen both in the context statement uh, phase and then also as we move through the surveys on the ground. Uh, and then finally to say, uh, for me at least, the citywide approach allows us to move beyond the ad hoc case by case approach to prioritization, which is what we've been up to, and to move to a citywide approach. And we worked with Ryerson's Master of Spatial Analysis uh, program to develop a multi-criteria evaluation tool uh, that we'll be using as well as criteria listed there to make sure that we are moving in a systematic, uh, data-driven way across the city of Toronto. So uh, how this becomes a reality and why, it's, why the timing is now, uh, Bill 108 is, while we don't know the specific implications, we do know the framework that no matter what, we're going to have to be faster on recommending to City Council on heritage designation and listing. Um, this, this type of survey feeds in not only uh, for something of that purpose, but also, I wanted to say the broad picture that we see of this survey. The survey is also going to feed into a variety of really important uh, tools that we use, and uh, be it through official plan or heritage uh, districts, 
urban design guidelines. I think the, the key for us is that this really is, uh, well, I shouldn't say the center of the universe. It does seem to be the center of the diagram. Um, it is, I think, what most importantly is, it has an output that will serve multiple purposes um, and uh, help us, I would say, transition and transform our, our practices on a day-to-day -day basis. This is especially essential for us that we recognize our investment that we need to do to modernize our heritage register. Our residents and our, and our community and our, our uh, investors are demanding more online accessible information, enriched in data that will serve them in a, in a timely manner. Um, it also allows us, I think, to celebrate the identity and, and our uh, uh, heritage that we have in our city. So where we see ourselves going and our next steps um, is certainly, I think, a pragmatic approach. Uh, what we can do immediately in this, in this uh, uh, operating year, in this fiscal year, is uh, proceeding with our work on our IT solution. We're laying the groundwork for that. We will be hiring our consultants to start out our contact statement if we are adopted by council and are giving the direction. And most importantly is uh, the legacy or our ongoing backlog that we have of outstanding nominations. We see that as our priority and our work in the, in the time ahead of us. The report itself uh, outlines the financial implications for us. I would say that the proposed approach for us is uh, incremental and proposes in this phase to be, if sufficiently resourced, we can efficiently and effectively identify heritage resources throughout the city while providing timely research and baseline data to serve us in the next uh, years to come. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to recommend to the committee that we take the uh, deputy, uh, the speakers first and then we ask questions of staff because um, actually that might uh, bring us some more questions. So, okay. And let's start with uh, Michael McClellan. Michael? Ooh, Michael looks very different. Uh, hi, my name is Alexis Cohen uh, with ERA Architects. I'm here with my colleague, Angela Garvey. We are attempting to fill Michael's shoes. Um, he sends his regrets. He couldn't make it today. Um, we are going to present a few comments that are an abbreviation of the uh, letter that uh, we have uh, submitted. Uh, we've reviewed the June 6 staff report on the citywide survey and wish to make the following comments. First, uh, we commend staff for their report and we appreciate the complexity of this undertaking. We also support the need for the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario and Heritage Toronto to play vital roles in its implementation. The survey constitutes the first serious reconsideration of how the city addresses heritage since 1973, when the Toronto Historical Board started its inventory. The technical expert panel consulted during the preparation of this report recommended that a manifesto be created. This framing document would explain why the survey needs to be undertaken and how it would be implemented. Why does the survey need to be undertaken? We'd like to make four points. First, in the last 30 years, the nature of heritage has changed. Instead of focusing on buildings and monuments, heritage can now celebrate many things. It can be indigenous people's cultural ties to the land. It can be the cultures of new Canadians. It can be intangible. Second, the existing heritage registry accumulates data on bricks and mortar heritage. The proposed survey should expand the definition of heritage. How do you assess the heritage value of the first Chinese shopping mall in Scarborough or indigenous cultural presence on the land? Third, the existing heritage register is heavily focused on the downtown core, understandable as the register was created by the former city of Toronto, but it is no longer representative of this great city. In recognizing heritage, we ascribe value to places. Every Torontonian should feel that their neighborhood has a history and that it is appreciated as part of the city. Fourth, a survey shouldn't result in a more intensely regulated municipal structure. Instead, it should open pathways for communities to celebrate the, his the city's broad cultural history and for volunteer networks to play a vital role in recognizing that diversity. How is the survey to be implemented? We would like to make four suggestions. First, expand beyond the Ontario Heritage Act. The act, which focuses on listing and designating individual properties, is too limited to address a contemporary understanding of heritage. 
Using the Act and its Regulation 906 as the main tools for implementing the survey is fraught with difficulty. While the Act could be used to identify and designate significant built heritage resources, it should not drive the methodology, nor should it be the primary lens through which tens of thousands of properties are evaluated. Second, work with planning staff. The planning staff, who know the neighborhoods of the city so well, should be instrumental in developing the foundational work of the survey. Their knowledge and expertise would help us better understand the city, not just for heritage stewardship, but for addressing planning issues as well. Third, conduct the survey in two clearly defined phases. The first phase should focus on discovering and understanding the history of Toronto, its neighbourhoods and the heritage values identified by communities. This phase should be undertaken without preset or assumed ideas about how this information will be regulated or used. It would include an overview of Toronto's urban morphology as well as neighbourhood heritage context statements that address community and social values. A subsequent phase would involve a deep dive into individual assessments of the more than 400,000 properties in the city. Fourth, have a timeline for completion of phase one. The foundational framework of phase one is essential to creating a comprehensive planning tool. After this phase, the city can assess the progress and direction of the survey and move to focus on the fine grain of individual buildings. The end goal is to bring Toronto together and to respect and recognize the expansive history of the amalgamated city and its citizens. We think a well-executed city survey can help make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions of the speaker? Councillor Matlow. Uh, just to, to contextualize it for me before I ask you these, uh, this question, are these, are these your words or are you reading Michael's words? I'm reading Michael's words. These are an abbreviated, this is a Coles Notes version of the letter that we submitted okay. and is on file. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you, so you may not be able to answer this, but uh, do your best uh, if Michael has briefed you on this. You, you read in Michael's uh, letter that we should be, uh, that the survey should be done not only with heritage, but with our planning staff to understand planning matters in concert with, with heritage. With all due respect, does Michael not understand that heritage staff are planning? They are called the heritage planning staff and, 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 a, and, a, and an important aspect of the planning process is to consider uh, whether or not there is merit in listing or the designation of, of heritage. As part. So in other words, my understanding of this survey is that it is all about making sure that there's more predictability and an understanding even before there's this sort of contested fight over, over a development so that everybody knows what they're working with. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I was confused by the idea of heritage having to consult with planning when they are planning. I think that what Michael would, would say and what we've, we've discussed also with, uh, with uh, Tamara and Gary um, is that our position is that the city survey should be conceptualized first and foremost as a planning tool and one of the lenses through which uh, to, look, to look, use that tool is for the purposes of heritage rather than the other way around. And so they are absolutely interlinked, but I think there's a subtle distinction between how you conceive of the exercise as a whole and then the ways in which you use it. So first, it's first and foremost a broad planning tool that can be used by any, any, um, any planning uh, department, any planning staff for any number of issues um, before planning staff, including heritage, rather than heritage leading the or creating the lens for all planning departments. Okay, w would you, um, perhaps this is more of a conversation I have directly with Michael, obviously, yeah. if, he, if he wrote yeah. the words, but uh, I just ask you to consider and pass on to Michael uh, that you know when we're considering her uh, heritage and we're considering all the other planning matters, that it's really important to recognize that, that heritage not only rhetorically is part of our planning process, but literally is part of our planning division. Absolutely, and I think that that's, that's how everyone sees this, this initiative as succeeding, is that Thank it's you. an integrated planning tool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Maggie Hutchison.
Good afternoon, Maggie. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Good afternoon and thank you uh, planning and housing committee members. My name is Susan Jama and I am the assistant curator of the Block by Block program and here with me today is Maggie Hus Hutchinson um, and she is the Block by Block program director. So the citywide heritage survey feasibility study includes a number of exciting recommendations. We are particularly pleased that diversity and social equity will be fundamental principles of the survey. It also offers an opportunity to strengthen intercultural community building and governance in Toronto neighborhoods. With strong support from Council, we believe the survey has the potential to enrich our citywide understanding of heritage itself, bringing underrepresented perspectives into both the heritage and planning sectors. One section of the staff report on the survey's feasibility focuses on public engagement, which will be vital to the success of the initiative. Given the exciting opportunities that this survey represents, the Toronto Ward Museum recommends that an equity-based public engagement approach to be articulated early in the process and be shared widely as, widely as part of public communications about the survey. Our experience running the Toronto Ward Museum's multi-year block-by-block program, a, pro a program that preserves and animates cultural heritage, has underscored the current disconnect between the heritage sector and and many equity-seeking groups, particularly immigrant communities and young racialized residents who live and work outside of downtown core. Put frankly, the residents we engage in this program do not typically see heritage initiatives as for them, nor as something that they can meaningfully contribute to. Our program model for Block by Block works to readdress this marginalization in a number of ways. In Block by Block, we hire racialized and newcomer residents to conduct research with and for other residents in their neighborhoods, drawing on their own social and cultural networks. Support the work of neighborhood research teams through multi-sector partnerships, particularly with agencies that serve indigenous residents and new immigrants and refugees. Seek leadership and support from our partner agencies when designing consultations, exhibitions, and events to ensure we meet community needs. Learn from residents about the associative and cultural values of local sites through story sharing, intergenerational exchange, and cultural and art-based methods. The block-by-block -block model has been extremely successful. Our approach to preservation of cultural heritage has been recognized both provincially and nationally and has received over 800,000 in funding to date. In 2007, the Department of Canadian Heritage and the Ontario 150 Fund supported us to work nationally with over 5,000 people, preserving oral histories in historical immigrant neighborhoods in Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto. Now with support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation, we are working extensively for three years in four Toronto areas, Agent Court, Victoria Park, Regent Park, and Parkdale. Learning about sites of cultural value from residents who are not typically engaged in heritage or planning initiatives. We welcome the committee to diversity and social equity in the citywide heritage survey report. With an equity-based approach to public engagement, this survey will both strengthen Toronto communities and enrich our collective understanding of Toronto's heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. that very insightful perspective. Um, Susan Jama? Yes. This was Susan Jama. Oh. I am Susan. <laughs> Sorry. So we presented together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Zichi Zhuang? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Uh, my name is Juicy Zhuang. I'm the associate professor at the School of Urban and Regional Planning, Ryerson University. And uh, I insure 
enthusiastically welcome the recommendations for a citywide heritage survey program. Um, this program is a proactive initiative in that it will help identify cultural heritage resources of pre and post-European settlement in multicultural Toronto. In addition, this heritage survey can be used as an effective tool to engage the public and enhance community empowerment and civic leadership in response to heritage preservation. Also, I'm delighted to see that social equity is considered a key goal of the Heritage Survey, which shows the commitment and the potential to include immigrants, refugees, indigenous and racialized people, and other marginalized members to voice underrepresented perspectives in the heritage planning and preservation process. As one of the most diverse and multicultural cities in the world, Toronto has an, 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 an untapped potential to preserve and enhance its unique cultural heritage, which requires equitable planning policies and processes to ensure the delivery of equitable outcomes, as cultural assets in diverse communities could be subtle, intangible, and unconventional. I would like to use two examples to specifically address the importance of and the needs for equitable community engagement as it will be vital to the success of this multi-year community-based heritage survey program. First, uh, as one of the research partners working with the Toronto Water Museum uh, in their block-by-block -block program in the past year, I have witnessed uh, successful youth engagement through the program in various immigrant neighborhoods. I echo the key concerns of marginalization here, as uh, I, I'm using the quote from uh, Susan and uh, Maggie's uh, presentation. The residents that uh, the Toronto Ward Museum engaged in immigrant neighborhoods do not typically see heritage initiatives as for them, nor as something they can meaningfully contribute to. Therefore, to properly and equitably engage marginalized community members, the Heritage Survey should consider meaningful and community-based and equity-based approaches. Second, um, in May 2019, the American Planning Association, the APA, released its first ever Planning for Equity Policy Guide, clearly stating planners' responsibility to address issues related to social equity and inclusion. It identifies a number of rec recommendations for planners to advocate for policies that apply an equity lens to a range of planning topics and focus areas of planning practices, such as heritage preservation and community engagement and empowerment. Um, I would like to uh, address some of the highlights of their key learnings, um, such as use targeted community-specific strategies for community engagement, avoid duplication of engagement efforts, hire community organizers to do outreach in underrepresented communities, encourage dialogue with public forums to share and appreciate cultural assets, safe structures designed by architects and designers of color, acknowledge inconvenient truths, encourage preservation of historic resources connected to the history of people of color, women, immigrants, and other traditionally under-recognized members of the community. Here I use uh, the Toronto Ward Museum example and the APA's Planning for Equity Guide as reference points. Uh, to, sum to summarize, the citywide heritage sub survey provides an exciting opportunity for diverse communities in Toronto to, to preserve and enhance their cultural heritage. Through an equity lens, diverse communities will be engaged collectively to bond with each other and help shape and reshape Toronto's cultural identity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Catherine Nasmith. I'm Catherine Naismith. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a member of the Technical Heritage Survey Expert Panel. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, we advise staff through the feasibility study. I support the staff recommendations and the additional motion from the Toronto Preservation Board. As one of the two signatures on the Toronto Star opinion piece which made the suggestion that a citywide heritage survey was urgently needed, the other signature was Michael McClelland, um, which with your support will move this. Um, I am very pleased to be here to applaud the completion of the feasibility study, which with your support will move this major undertaking forward. 
As a former governor, um, I am pleased that the National Trust for Canada is applauding the city's initiative. It's precedent setting for the country, and it will not be the first time the City of Toronto has led the field in heritage conservation. While we would always love to see such projects move faster, it's also important to think carefully about how to approach such a major undertaking. Frustration with the current pace of listing and designation has mounted across the city as we see our neighborhood touchstones disappearing. Dealing with the current backlog is such an important first step, and I'm pleased to see this as a priority. I worry that the recent changes to the Ontario Heritage Act will make it harder to protect what is valued by communities. A principle enshrined in all versions of the Ontario Heritage Act until Bill 108, which significantly Bill 108 significantly weakens local decision making. The City of Toronto may need to find its own local system, as it had before the Ontario Heritage Act was drafted in 1976, to avoid the endless stream of appeals which will inevitably follow the recent provincial introduction of new ways to circumvent the Ontario Heritage Act. Whatever tools we use to protect what we value, we need to know what is out there across the city and we need to the city to engage with communities to gather that information. I, I was invited to serve on the, on, on the TEP as a heritage practitioner and I was also able to be a bridge to the work being done by the Toronto branch of the Architectural Conservancy, Ontario. In my volunteer capacity, I've been intimately connected with the development of TO Built with ACOTO. TO Built was developed as a tool to allow everyone who has information to share it. ACO is in a position to start working with neighborhoods to gather what they know into TO Built, where it can be a resource to city staff, other communities, and anyone interested in Toronto's built environment. It is by no means a substitute for the database the city must develop, but it will facilitate information gathering while the city develops its own process. I look forward to working with, with council, city staff, the architectural profession, and communities to better understand the places that matter across Toronto and to find ways to keep them safe for future generations. That's me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Any, uh, anyone else that would like to speak on this item? No? Okay. Questions of staff? Oh, there is one. Oh, there's one? Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Caitlin Wainwright and I'm the Director of Programming at Heritage Toronto and I want to thank you for allowing Heritage Toronto to be here today to speak in support of the Toronto Heritage Survey. As your City of Toronto agency, we are mandated to represent the voices and interests of the Toronto public and heritage community. In 2018, we worked with over 100 community organizations and more than 150 volunteers. Earlier the, this uh, year, each of Toronto City Council members received a copy of our State of Heritage report, which I'm holding up. This report contains 17 recommendations about how to better preserve and promote the city's rich heritage. The report was informed by consultation with over 70 community groups and neighborhood organizations that value our city's heritage. It identified a citywide heritage survey as the critical heritage issue for the city to address. But that wasn't the first time that we called for this. Uh, Heritage Toronto first called for a proactive survey of properties in 2001, 18 years ago, during its first State of Heritage report. Our predecessors noted that, quote, Toronto's built heritage inventory is woefully incomplete, and they called for a more complete record of Toronto's built cultural and natural heritage that would be a valuable tool for planners, developers, tourism, and the municipal government. We have since reiterated that call in 2011, 2015, and most recently this past February in the State of Heritage report. Since amalgamation, Heritage Toronto has held the position that you cannot protect what you don't know is important. The conservation of cultural heritage resources is an integral component of good city planning. It contributes to a sense of place, economic prosperity, as well as healthy and equitable communities. And I'd like to echo the comments of the other speakers that the principle of socially equitable engagement is indeed important to the success of the proposed survey. Heritage conservation is absolutely compatible with development. Some of the most innovative and exciting residential, commercial, and institutional projects in our city right now have their roots in a heritage building. And this October, our 45th annual Heritage Toronto Awards will celebrate some of those uh, incredible built heritage projects. 
Citywide surveys, as staff have mentioned, are a best practice planning tool. Torontonians have been waiting for action on this for nearly two decades, so we are pleased to see the forward momentum that the Heritage Inventory Survey has gained over the past year, um, and we commend the work of our colleagues in city planning and look forward to supporting the implementation of this long-awaited Toronto Heritage Survey. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, anybody else that would like to speak on this item? No? Okay. Questions of staff? No? Uh, Councillor Bradford? Of staff. Okay. Great. Councillor Bradford? Um, thanks very much, the Chair. Um, I think the report and presentation, you raise a really good point about our need to make heritage preservation proactive rather than reactive. That's where we want to get to. Um, how do we do the work of heritage conservation in a way that moves towards creating that predictability for new development, and how does the report help us do that? Maybe I'll start and, and Mary can pick up. Uh, I, I just draw your attention to uh, page 15 in the presentation. Uh, because as we prepared this presentation as a staff group, this was, uh, you know, a f we were trying to communicate the essence of what we're putting in, in front of council, which is, um, and I often use the analogy of the, the tree bylaw, where we know intuitively that if your tree is 30 centimeters or more, you are going to be on the radar of the city. Uh, and owners should, should uh, you know, can come to the city and expect to hear what our tree replacement policies are or uh, injuring a tree and all, all, everything that goes with that. So for, for us in developing the Heritage Survey, we'll have a good early understanding of both the context of uh, the history of the city and its, uh, its, uh, its growth and change uh, across the entire uh, breadth of the city. Uh, but also landowners will know that as well because this will be done transparently and in the public domain. So it's an essential, you know, uh, ingredient in understanding what you can, what you can, uh, uh, how you experience your neighborhood and, and how you can utilize your property going forward. And ultimately it can shape both development applications but also uh, policies of, of the city or other approaches of the city. So very much it's a heritage planning tool it will just make us smarter overall about how to uh, approach uh, the growth and change that's happening across the city. I don't know, Mary, do you want to supplement that? I, I think that sums it up very nicely, unless Councillor Bradford has another follow-up uh, question to that. Uh, I have more different questions. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, could you, um, we talked about how we're moving away from a block-by-block -block heritage uh, heritage work, how will we be achieving better better outcomes by, by taking a new approach that's less focused on the block by block? Well, currently our approach isn't even exactly block by block. It tends to be site by site. Uh, and that is very uh, time consuming and frustrating for everybody. So what the survey would aim to do is to provide historic context statements for uh, every part of this city, which provides a foundational layer against which an understanding of the importance of individual buildings can be measured. So it actually allows us to do uh, a few things at once. It allows us to understand individual properties as they relate to their areas and also to the city. So right now when we look at a property, we're very much focused on that lot, on that block. Uh, and this would allow us to be more broad-minded about an understanding of the different types of resources in the city, the different locations. And I believe that um, one of the f fundamental strengths of this is going to be early on getting that context uh, layer right and having the community engagement that we've talked about and the equity lens. So when you look at page three, those maps there in the slide deck. Could you just give us a sense of how much of the heritage work was done in the core versus outside of the core and how we're expecting that to change on, in the study? There was another slide that showed areas of development pressure, a, a graduated map there, uh, page 13. 
development application intensity by neighborhood and community council area. How will this new approach, uh, how are we expecting that to change with this study? Okay, well the map on, uh, on slide three um, gives you a sense of when, where we have done intentional surveys, and by intentional surveys I mean as a part of a secondary plan, a planning study, uh, or a heritage conservation district study. And so that's in the map on the right. Those uh, tend to be um, more plentiful in the downtown area really because uh, the planning tools are often development driven. So uh, divisionally, we are trying to put uh, planning tools in place uh, either to prepare for development or to accompany it as it's, uh, as it's happening. Um, and a lot of those little dots that you see on the left are um, either part of conservation districts or they are the site-by-site -site resolutions that have come up when someone has applied to uh, develop a property uh, and a heritage building has either uh, already been identified or is identified through the planning process. So it's not that we've intentionally surveyed the downtown and not surveyed the rest. It really is uh, part of the divisional response to where the development is happening. What this proposes to do, which will bring a lot more uh, equity, um, not just in terms of social and cultural equity, but also in terms of district equity, is on uh, page 13, um, uh, staff call that, it's a, it's a heat map. So rather than taking a look at, you can run the numbers and you can say, where's the development? And you can see downtown Toronto lighting up. Well, if you run that same question, district by district, what you see is the hot areas within each district, not just an overall emphasis of development downtown. So it's our intention to ensure that within the districts we are understanding areas, uh, understanding the changes relative and that uh, things are happening in those districts as well. Okay, Thanks very much. that was your last That's question. Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you. With respect to the survey versus the individualized um, technical listing, um, the criteria is to, to make it onto that citywide survey. Uh, can, you dif uh, can you distinguish the, the two for us? I'm assuming the threshold is, is, is a lot lower. Uh, I can speak to that, uh, Councillor. Um, uh, what, what we have uh, determined is that, or our approach as in other municipalities, is we actually believe that we need to use the regulation 906, the provincial criteria. Um, this is uh, uh, so that we are in a state of readiness if we do need to move ahead. Um, one of the things that we have done though with the criteria, the provincial criteria, is that often it does say, and what does it mean to the con contextual value of the area, but we've had that as the missing piece. Um, so we, we need these sort of broader statements the way that we've done with our heritage districts or broadly to, to really put it in perspective of what does it mean to be in King Parliament in an industrial area from the 19th century. We didn't have that before. We would go case by case as an individual research. So I would actually say that this gives us uh, an, uh, an enhanced understanding so that we can ask uh, our questions in the criteria and evaluation and to be efficient. Um, we, we will not go into a deep dive on individual research the way that we do with designation. So we do see the survey accelerating our identification, those two things, a historic overview and uh, being able to sort of have a comparative uh, analysis that we didn't have before we make us well positioned. And while you'll be drawing um, uh, sort of inspiration from best examples uh, in other cities, or whether it's Hamilton, Ottawa, Brantford, or cities in the U.S., Los Angeles, San Francisco, they're listed in your report, um, how many of those other cities and jurisdictions actually have an indigenous engagement strategy? I'm not aware. So, no, I don't, I'm not aware. I'm not so aware we, we don't have those examples that yeah. we consulted, but I would say the Australian model and yeah. the New Zealand, there's a, Auckland has done exceptional work and we've been looking at theirs as best practice. Um, and I would say that, you know, one of the things for us always is to uh, 
call out to those who have done that, but I, I would think that this would be groundbreaking work for us. Um, specifically, the work that we're looking at as an Indigenous strategy for us is what are those 19th century and contemporary places that are of cultural value and use by the community, not the 10,000 years ago uh, the lake shore uh, was used or the lake's edge was used. Okay, um, thank you because you're getting to, to where I, I, I'd like to explore. Um, with Indigenous culture and, and knowledge and, and even the way we explore placemaking today, um, the, the cultural and natural values uh, that are placed, placed in place or situated in place uh, is often discussed um, amongst Indigenous knowledge and, and, and learnings and storytelling. Um, and the Indigenous community did not necessarily build monuments and buildings to themselves. They lived very differently from us, probably uh, lots that we can learn from. The Heritage um, uh, Act has largely been focused on the built form, uh, post-contact. Um, if we're drawing examples from Auckland and New Zealand and, uh, and Australia, um, recognizing how, how, how they've developed the relationships with the indigenous communities there, um, I would say that we're probably not as far advanced in our relationships with the indigenous communities, especially not in, in urban centers like Toronto. BC may have a different um, uh, relationship, but I, I think we're, we're very, very different. Um, how, would we, how would we do that work with a community without co-opting them, without engaging in consultation that is literally just touching base at a table and then walking away? What would that look like? I, I'm, I'm very curious to, to know what this Indigenous statement would look like? Um, through the Chair, I think from the outset, what we envision is A, not, not consultation, and even further than engagement. Uh, it is to actually um, have a separate uh, strategy that involves Indigenous groups in this city who will be answering those questions for themselves not trying to fit themselves into a predetermined idea that we have. Uh, we spend a lot of time going over this report and, and different versions of presentations, always noticing the word uh, property, you know, because we talk about heritage properties, and every time we saw property, strike it out. We're not talking properties. Not always. Sometimes we are. Um, so we will be looking to our Toronto Indigenous communities, both ancestral and, and urban and transplanted, uh, that, to define those things for themselves. And we will have to develop a special way of ensuring that w if it's a map layer or if it's a special kind of register or whatever it is that it reflects the worldview and experiences of those individuals. That's very important to us and it's very important to us that we do it first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fletcher. No, you're good. Uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, just two quick questions. So basically, how did the how would the um, citywide heritage survey reduce the backlog in an efficient manner going forward? Um, so one of the things I think for us is the um, first is this historic context across the city. We have yet to do that as a document itself. The other I would say is that we have a strategy for us with our backlog and we've talked about it. Uh, one of the things I think is to, to start uh, triaging and actually understanding the, the right now we've had most of the time as individual requests. Uh, one of the things that we would look at is as groupings. How could we benefit um, from like to like uh, uh, as it might be itself? Um, and frankly, I think we have also an opportunity that if we set out a course of us knowing how to do that research, uh, we can also utilize some of our consulting dollars that we've yet to be able to do um, with our consultants because we just haven't had the confidence in them being able to do it if we have a, a rigor to which we wish to have it done. Uh, there's a variety of ways, Council, that we can uh, uh, benefit from this, but I would say most importantly is a holistic and a comprehensive view that we need to deal with. Thank you. And I just want to zero in on Young Eglinton for a minute and the Troll Funeral Home. I think I did send you an email about this. Um, there are beside it on Alexandra Boulevard two very significant pillars that have seemed to have fallen apart. 
I know it was a real passion of uh, Councillor Milchin when he was in um, Councillor Balao's position as the Chair of Planning and, um, and Growth at the time. Um, those pillars are literally falling apart and the Troll Funeral Home is about to be demolished. Uh, do you have any feedback for me on whether those are heritage aspects of our city that should be preserved or it's the west side of Young? Uh, through the chair, I, I am aware of that being an ongoing issue over the years. Uh, I believe that it's a kind of a complicated answer that uh, the piers themselves have been rebuilt over time. Um, I think they, they certainly have value in the sense that people value them. That's kind of the point of understanding what heritage is, right, what people value. Um, they are not uh, protected, and I believe we were contacted about it a number of years ago. Uh, and um, determined that they were not going to be added to the register at some point. Um, but I, I think there are conversations ongoing. Uh, Maybe I can suggest that we follow up with the, the councillor yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah, if we could, because um, my understanding is they are historically significant, the pillars, and in my opinion, Troll Funeral Home is also. So I'd love to have more information on that because um, uh, it's about to hit the wrecking ball is about to hit it. Great, thank you. Um, I do have uh, a couple of questions myself. I just want to follow up on uh, Councillor Wong Tam's questioning. Um, she, uh, she was asking about the indigenous, indigenous communities, and I would like to ask about some of our immigrant communities. So, what's going to be our strategy to? Um, have that equity lenses uh, in there as well, and how do we ensure that that big part of our history of our city is captured through this survey? Um, from uh, no. Attention. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. We I think we can continue, Mary. <laughs> Work through the lockdown. Uh, sure, uh, Gary. Mind Meadema, as well. <laughs> Gary Meadema will uh, will answer your question. Uh, I, I think partnerships are going to be key to the engagement program, and uh, so one of the recommendations is to investigate partnerships. And I, I think uh, to answer a couple of questions, if we have a partner like the Toronto Public Library, for example. Uh, they will be able to help be a resource to gather information to make it accessible for, uh, for others beyond city planning. With regards to cultural communities, one of the uh, advantages, uh, we're, we're choosing to use the city's um, neighborhoods, defined neighborhoods that are correlated with census data. So we'll be able to comb that census data back through years to identify cultural communities that have lived in various parts of the city. And then we intend to reach out to those communities and as we move through, through the city, we will be reaching out to them and to ask them about their stories that relate back to, to places where they may no longer be. So I live in Little Portugal uh, and, and that's a great example. There are many others. So I think that's part of the research and the context statement approach as well is to gather those stories and make sure we know um, who was where um, and how we can dig up those stories through the engagement. And we are going to work with you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, speakers, Councillor Matlow. Well, I'm uh, as, both as a councillor but also as a Torontonian, I'm just so excited to see this item finally arrive at this committee. Um, uh, Councillor Wong Tam and I moved a motion in 2015, and it was called, uh, I, I think quite appropriately, Catching Up with the Past, Improving the City's Heritage Preservation Framework. Uh, but as you've heard, that, that motion wasn't alone. Uh, there have been other members over the years that have moved motions, citizens throughout the years, requesting something like uh, what uh, we hopefully will be moving forward with today. And you know, the reason that we called this uh, Catching Up with the Past initially in the motion was 
that um, Toronto, unlike so many cities around the world, here in Canada, throughout North America, um, you know, ha ha has not been as successful as cities like Boston and, and you know, Montreal, cities that we know and love, uh, uh, at, at preserving the both architectural and cultural heritage uh, that tells their story. Uh, and their story is everything from uh, the uh, indigenous peoples of the lands uh, to the many uh, waves of immigration that have come through uh, our city uh, to, um, to the stories of uh, uh, people that we've all read about, to people who we've never heard about, but perhaps had uh, some architectural design features that they contributed to our city uh, that stand out and should be recognized and preserved and protected. I think it's really important, though, that we understand you know, what this is, but also what this isn't. You know, what this is is about uh, knowing what we have. Um, it's about recognizing that we can't always be playing uh, reaction. Every time that there's uh, about to be a demolition, or perhaps a demolition that we legally, because of the governance structure that we have, cannot say no to, as was the case with uh, the Stollery's uh, experience, uh, or, B or the BMO building. Uh, so, I mean, and every time this happens, there's an outcry, and the, 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 the councillors and the community says, why, why didn't you do something earlier? And uh, our heritage planning staff say, well, we, we didn't have the tools to do that. We would have liked to. Uh, we have an opportunity now to provide them with those tools, the tools that we've asked them to have and the tools that they've asked us to provide. Um, what this isn't about is sterilizing every building in Toronto. Um, uh, there have been, um, uh, there are some buildings that need full preservation, clearly. I mean, there were, there were some efforts many years ago to demolish Old City Hall. Uh, there were efforts to demolish Union Station. I think most every Torontonian couldn't imagine being without those buildings, and frankly, many Torontonians don't even know about many of the buildings that they don't know about because they were demolished at that time in the phoneme name of progress. Uh, many of those sites that were demolished remain parking lots up until the 1980s, 90s. But what this does do is that this provides predictability. It provides some surety both for the city and for the development industry. Uh, it makes it less, uh, less adversarial when we get into a dynamic where we have to consider a development if everybody knows you know, what we're working with. Um, what this isn't, again, is sterilizing. Uh, I can actually give you a couple of good examples within my ward just because I know these, uh, these sites well. Uh, one would be, um, 1982 to 1984 Young Street. Uh, this was a, a kind of an extreme example of where there was an, a heritage investigation, and it was determined that it actually didn't need to be preserved because there were so many different changes in this building. Lester B. Pearson, former Prime Minister, once lived there. So there was an agreement to put a plaque, to do kind of various, various things to recognize the, 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 the history of having Prime Minister Pearson living there without sterilizing the building. And not only did we move forward with the redevelopment, but we also fought and won to get affordable housing into that building. Uh, there's another example of a mid-rise going that hopefully will go up uh, along Young Street in my ward, where um, this was part of the batch listings. Do you remember the Midtown in Focus batch listings that we did? And there were a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, this is gonna sterilize. There's not gonna be any housing. Uh, this is gonna freeze everything in time. What this is gonna do if it moves forward is retain the character of Young Street with the buildings, uh, uh, the facades and, 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 and the main part of the structure out front. So as you walk along Young Street, it will feel like the Young Street that we know and love and, and recognize and preserve the architectural features that merit preservation while allowing a mid-rise building to go up around it and above it that provide housing and more opportunities in the community. That's good planning, and that's where heritage planning and all the other planning matters come together and do something right. Um, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that, um, you know, I, uh, I've seen other cities, um, I've been envious of other cities where, uh, like if you walk through Boston, you will, you, there are streets where you can imagine yourself, uh, you know, watching as the Patriots uh, march down the streets. You, you, you walk along the Freedom Trail, you see not just ad hoc buildings here and there, but neighborhoods that have, that, have, that have been preserved. But they also did it while acknowledging that there needed to be growth in it, within it, and around it. 
And I think that we can do that here in Toronto. Uh, but most importantly, um, when, we, when we moved this motion in the first place, we didn't know that Bill 108 would be around the corner. And that's why now is more important than ever to move forward as quickly as possible to use every tool that we still have in the toolbox to be able to identify and protect whatever we have remaining. I want to also uh, thank staff, if I may, uh, just um, uh, Mary, Tamara, Liz, all of you. Um, they have put their, their hearts and their minds and the experience and time into this. And uh, I once kind of bashed them for not moving fast enough. And I know I did because I was anxious. I wanted this done. And now they're coming and they're saying they're ready to move forward. And I just wanted to express my Thank heartfelt you. gratitude for what they're doing. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Can I, um, can I just ask for us to check on the protocol related to a lockdown? So the clerks has been checking with the manager of clerks and she's following, we're following instructions from clerks. Okay. And right now we've been told to proceed. So we have been checking. Yeah. The acting BCM is checking as well. So I've I've been asked, I've, we've been asking if. Okay, Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to move a motion, which I've advanced, circulated to everyone. Um, for your consideration. Um, as we've heard today, the city's heritage work extends far beyond our old buildings. Uh, I do appreciate uh, all of the... So we just need to lock the doors. Uh, clerks is asking us to stay in the room and lock the doors. So what's the procedure? Call a recess and do we stay in this room? Locking the doors? Yeah. Yeah. 